today to have Chris Murray, who is the new um, president and CEO of MSU Foundation, Alumni Foundation. Started in September, uh, still in the transition of moving from uh, his previous position. He was the vice president for university advancement at the University of Idaho. And uh, before that, he served as associate dean of external affairs at the University of Oregon and as Director of Development for the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. So a lot's happening in the foundation. We're really excited to uh, hear from Chris and also talk about what the possibilities are in environmental areas. So thanks. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm so impressed that people would take their lunch hour to come hear me talk. So I'm, I'm, and the pressure's on now. I've got to deliver. Um, I'm going to talk pretty. Um, at a high level regarding um, the foundation and the philanthropic community generally, and then open up for qu any questions that you all might have. And if there's anything that I don't touch on uh, towards the end, just please um, please let me know. So the, um, the mission for the Montana State University Alumni Foundation is to do two, two basic things. Create lifelong relationships with our alumni and friends, and to seek, manage, and distribute private resources to support Montana State University. So we talk about that, and really what that is is our alumni efforts and our fundraising efforts. We have a long history at the foundation, and, and, and other public universities like our, us also have long histories where it starts out maybe with one, um, op, one, one strategy or one mission and morphs over time. For example, in 1946, what we called the Research Foundation was established. At that time, really the foundation was about, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to start doing more research. We need, a, we need a, a private entity to do that, um, so that's what the foundation should be. But over time, it's really morphed and changed into uh, what it is today, which are uh, three different things, really primarily two different things. One, we have an alumni association, which is really uh, its goal is to engage our alumni. We do events. Uh, we have um, materials, newsletter materials. You can, uh, we have a membership organization, so you can join, and then you affiliate with the university and we provide opportunities for, uh, for you to be engaged with your university. The other is the foundation itself, which is the, the 501c3 nonprofit entity that basically is, is out raising money for the university. And we actually receive money, we receipt money, and then we distribute that money to the university based on the donor's wishes. And we can talk a little bit about that later. And the third thing, which you may have heard about, uh, which is a little different than these other two elements, is the Innovation Campus, which is a 42-acre research park that's been envisioned for the last several years. And uh, those of you who are familiar with research parks, they are designed to provide space for companies, either companies emerging out of the university or companies that have an other, other research missions that fit nicely with the university to be contiguous to the university and to hire graduate students to work with faculty and to grow their businesses. So those are really the three things that that we do. In the past fiscal year, uh, on our fundraising side, we've had almost 8,000 donors make uh, 9,000 gifts to the university, totaling $23 million. So we're very proud of that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to change that, uh, hopefully affect that going forward. The foundation itself, uh, when we get gifts of endowments, there's really two kinds of gifts. There's gifts that are current gifts, which, is, which are gifts that we put to use right away. A, a donor will say, Here's $5,000, I want to support a student scholarship, and we spend that money immediately. Then there are um, endowment gifts that come into the university that we actually uh, endow, we invest those, and we pay off 4% of those each year, and those funds then grow over time. And the reason you have a 4% payout typically is so that you can, um, you can hedge inflation over time, which means you hope to raise, generate more than the 4% in the market, um, and so then what, what happens is those funds grow over time. And you, you all are familiar with the, the large universities that you've heard about that have very large endowments. Um, and, and those are powerful things because those are funds that come forward each year in a continuous manner that are outside of the state funding model. So uh, last year we, er, we earned 15% uh, on our, um, our long-term investment pool. We gave out $3 million in scholarships, which went to almost 2,000 different people. And um, our, our, our students student-focused and our, our professors and chairs was about three and a half million. And then our big, big, big area with last year was um, facilities. And we've had two real great opportunities on our campus with two very large gifts, one Jake Jabs for our business school and one Norm as Bjornsson for the Norm as Bjornsson Innovation Center, which is going to be a phenomenal facility.
facility on our on our campus. Again, private money fueling that growth. That growth. Uh, we also have association members. We have about 12,100 members. Uh, these are folks that affiliate with the university. Some of them are, give us an annual uh, an annual membership fee of about $45 a year. Others pay a one-time fee and become life members. Uh, we have lots of volunteers who do lots of things for us, and we're very excited about that. They come to all kinds of different things, and they support the university in all kinds of different ways. Of course, and there's one purpose for all of this is wrapped around, and that is how do we advance Montana State University. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the relationship between the university and uh, the foundation. There are really two kinds of models when you look, look around universities these days. One model is where the foundation is rather small, and they basically have an accounting function, a gift receiving function, and maybe the investment function. And the fundraising staff and the alumni staff are all on the university side of the house, and they're all paid by the university. They're all university employees. So places like Oregon, that's the model they have. Places like Idaho, place, two places I've been, that's the model they have. Then you have other models where the foundation is a little bit larger, sometimes significantly larger for some of the big universities, and all the fundraising team and all those other duties I just mentioned are all inside the foundation. That's the model that we have. Um, and so we have, um, we, we hire, we do our own IT, we do our own um, manage it, we manage the gifts, we do all of our, all of our own fu the fundraising, all for the benefit of the university, but all in the private, this private, um, corporation, which is a 501c3. So what we really tried to do over the years is to delineate what's the university's role in that, in that model and what's our role in that model. And so, and, and I'll just mention, the reason it's the Alumni Foundation, which is a little interesting and, and, uh, and, and somewhat unique, but I think a trend that's going to be happening nationwide, is we used to have two 501c3s. We used to have the foundation, which did basically the fundraising, uh, the money management, and then we had the Alumni Association, which has its own 501c3, which, which was in, engaging our alumni. And when President Crusado arrived, she said, I'd really like you to look at how do we bring those two together. Uh, and, and really, if you think about it, the culture of engagement, which is our alumni, and the culture of philanthropy really are similar. They're both about engaging people who care about the university, its mission, and its impact. And so, uh, Surprisingly, that merger actually happened. It's a rare, it's rare. If you look around the United States today, there's only a handful of examples. We just had two of our staff um, go, to our case, go to a case conference recently and actually presented on this. And the questions that they got were fascinating. One of the, the mo most common question was, how on earth did you do that? Because both have boards, both have egos, both have missions. And so where we are today, I think, is really unique. And, uh, and I think over the next five, 10 years, you're going to see other universities move in this, in, in this direction because this engagement piece is absolutely essential both to having people uh, participate in the, the life of the university, but also having people give to the university. So these are some of the things that, uh, that, that we, we, we talk about. Uh, the university sets the funding priorities. The university um, uh, provides us with a little bit of funding to operate ourselves, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, they, they allow, they give us data when we hire a faculty member, you know, they, they give us that information, we manage the database. When a student comes in, we get that information so our database can be robust. Uh, on our side of the house, we manage the alumni relations function, we do the, uh, we do the fundraising function, um, and we manage all those other idea, all those other elements there that are listed, um, including receiving gifts and managing those assets on behalf of the university. An interesting fact that I think most people don't know is the size of philanthropic market in the, in the, in the U.S. It's huge. Uh, $335 billion was given in 2013, and it's interesting to me to see how that's broken up. But you'll see here that education um, is, the, is, is the second largest. Really, other is a, is a mishmash of lots of different things. But religious, religious entities are number one, and then education is, is number two. Um, $52 billion went to higher education in 2013. And so as I look at that, um, uh, I say to myself, where's our market share, right? We need to make sure that we have our, our piece of that pie. The reality is that public universities like ours are relatively new to fundraising, and MSU is no exception. We've probably been fundraising in a sophisticated manner for, call it, 20 years. But the Harvards and my alma mater, USC, and those folks, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. And so we are relatively new, 
And one of the one of the things that we struggle with because we're new is finding the resources to actually fund our operations because it, if it's unknown to people, they don't understand what it is, then finding resources when resources are tight is always hard. So in my entire career, you've always been at the table with, um, you know, the Department of, of Engineering, and they're saying, well, we need to hire two more faculty, and I'm at the table saying, I need two more fundraisers, and you're at the same, you're, you're all at that same, uh, the same trough, if you will, trying to get the funding that you need. And so um, that's, a, that's an interesting element for us, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. This is our endowment. Um, this is our endowment results over the last several years. The blue bar is our endowment, and the, and the yellow bar is the total assets for the university. So we own other assets, cash, and other kinds of assets that we have, and again, all on behalf of the university that, um, uh, that have grown over the years. And my great hope is that that endowment total, you know, the more that endowment total rises, um, the more certainty you can start to have from those funds, and again, those funds sit outside of the state. So, I think I, I think I read coming in that in, in 20 years ago, 80% of the higher ed budget in the state was paid for by uh, by the state, and that that not down is now down to about 35% or so. So you've seen a decline, and that's not just Montana; that's a national trend, a decline in state funding for higher ed. And one of the things, the, the power of um, of, of fundraising is you can start to, uh, in a very targeted way, bring, bring uh, funds to the table. So last year we created a lot of different endowed funds. We have about 1,300, I think is, is the right, is something like that, 1,300 individual funds for these kinds of, that last year these were the kinds of places where, that, that actually secured endowments. And the way endowments work again is we take those monies in, but the donor, the donor decides. We have a very uh, donor-centric operation um, in that, we, we, when we work with a donor, we're cultivating that relationship. The donor says, we always ask the donor, what are you passionate about? What do you care about? And, they're, they, they, and it's all over the map, as you can imagine. Sometimes it's athletics. Sometimes it's um, arts. Sometimes it's a, a specific academic unit. Sometimes it's a faculty member they remember fondly. Um, and so the donor actually, in what we, what we call a donor agreement, when we sit down and they make a gift in the down, they actually determine how those funds are going to be spent. So they'll say, I go from a student from Southwest Montana, who is, you know, who's a first generation uh, student, because that's what I, that's where I came from, and that's what I was. And so that's our role as a fiduciary is to make sure that we match up those needs or those donor requirements with the needs of the university, and we so we work a lot with financial aid and making those connections. But really, that's a core philosophy for us: is the donor decides. I'm sorry. This is the number. This is the number of endowments established in each of those. Uh, no. So there were ten uh, endowments established for the College of Engineering last year. And again, the alumni side is an important piece for us. This is a slide that's interesting to me. It's, it shows the number of annual members who give uh, that forty-five, fifty-five dollars a year uh, for membership, and then those that are um, those that are lifetime members. And those folks feel many of them. They come to lots of events. They feel connected to the university. They, they, they talk passionately about the university, and they're engaged in many ways. There's a, um, we did some analysis, and it's been done nationally in terms of people that are association members and also donors. And as you can imagine, there's a high correlation there. If you're involved and you're engaged, you tend to, be, uh, you tend to give. Uh, this is a terrible slide, so I apologize for it, but it's, um, it's showing that we have members in every state. Um, Several states are, we have a lot, um, and so I'm, I, that's so small, I apologize for that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the fundraising um, approach and the fundraising um, process, if you will. Really, the way that we think about it in our industry is, is there's really three, I really think about it as a pyramid in three basic ways. One, there's the annual fund. Those are the folks where a student would graduate and you call them up, we could do a phone-a-thon and we call them up and we say, would you give us $10? Uh, we also do a lot of work, uh, and we're going to get better at this because I think our effort here at Montana State University can be improved in terms of our faculty and staff campaign, which is really not about dollar amount, it's about participation. So somebody would give $20, $40, $50, that's, that's what we call our annual fund, any gift that would be up to $999. $9 the special gift category is giving at the 1000 to 24999 and we look at that as a different group at a different segment, and then our major gift work is of gifts at the $25,000 and above. 
And what we do is we tend to think of ourselves um, in those categories because you have different strategies based on your constituents uh, in terms of their capacity, where they're giving now, where, where we think they might be able to give. So what do people give? They give all kinds of different things. We take cash, of course, that's, that's the best one. It's easiest. Um, stocks and bonds, retirement assets, insurance, those kinds of things. And they give, they give differently. They give to, through different vehicles. Uh, one of the things that's most growing right now in our, in our um, society and in, in our industry is gifts of, uh, out, of, out of people's estates. Because what you can do is you can take an asset. Uh, let's say you have uh, some stock that's with a, with a low basis. You can take an asset. You can give it to us. We put it into a charitable uh, remainder unit trust. We pay you income on your life uh, based on that your age. And then when you die, that money then comes to the university for the purpose for which you determined it. And so what's, what you see with people that have amassed wealth in our country is this is becoming much more popular because they can actually um, get some income from their, themselves and their family and then make a charitable gift. And you get it, actually you get a deduction for doing that as well. So that's really a growing, a growing area for, for us. So those are some of the types of gifts, how people give and what they give to. So back to the pyramid. The annual fund is really focused um, on several different areas. We have a phone-a-thon where we have students. We employ them. They call. How many here have gotten a call from a student? Okay, good. We're, getting, we're, doing, we're doing our work. Um, they're great. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're wonderful. They're genuine. Uh, they do a wonderful job. So we actually have a calling center part of our operation. We train them. Um, we pay them. They do, they do wonderful work. So that's our phone-a-thon. We also do a direct mail. A program where, again, we're looking at these segments. If you graduated from the business school, we have a message from the College of Business Dean. We're telling you about the priorities of the business school. We're asking you to support the business school. Uh, reunion giving is an area that's new to us, but it's been very popular around the country and some, some, an area where I think we have great opportunity. That's where you bring people back for their, uh, their reunion years, and you typically you, develop a pro you identify a project on campus that they're going to give to, and they rally around. They do something for their year. Uh, we have a lot of different special campaigns. Student philanthropy is actually trying to get students while they're here on campus engaged um, and understand the power of philanthropy at privates. I know when, when I was at my uh, alma mater, if you sat a seat, it had somebody's name on it. The building, the, the room had somebody's name on it. The building had somebody's name on it. And really the, the unwritten social contract was when you go off and have a career, Part of what we're expecting you to do is give back. Public universities are still, as I said, relatively new to that. And, and training our students and, and educating them is something that um, is, is not, only, not only we're doing, but it's a trend nationally and try to make, um, make them more aware of the power of philanthropy. When you go to jobs and you're in there as a business student, every one of those students should know this building was made possible by somebody like you who went off and had a career and then gave back. Uh, we do a lot of different university appeals, and then, of course, the Alumni Association does membership drives. Uh, on our major giving uh, effort, we really try to focus on, uh, we do a lot of work on wealth screening. So this may be surprising to some of you, but we take our database and we, we run it through a, a filter that tells us where do people live, have they given. Uh, we also do terrible things, like we look to see what the ten, through the 10Ks and see do people own stock, uh, have they sold a company. And so we, we're able to then uh, look at our database and, and sort that based on capacity, because really what development is about is relationships, but then it's also about inclination, do people care, and then capacity, can they give? And so we, we organize ourselves around uh, what we call um, portfolios of people that we've identified that we think might be generous to the university, and then we have staff that actually work with those individuals. And we do so by having folks assigned to an academic unit in some cases, and we also break it up along uh, regions. So something that I asked, a couple of the questions I asked when I got here was, where do we have the most alumni who are rated at $25,000 and above? So could you guess what city that would be? Where, do we have, where does Montana State have the most people who ha are rated the highest? Any guess? Close. That's number two. That was really close. Seattle, 1,500 people in Seattle who are rated um, at the $25,000, and that's twice anywhere. It's twice Denver. Denver's about seven, 780. So my question was, okay, are, are we aligned appropriately? Do we have, if that's true, are we spending enough time, or are people spending enough time? So we really look at regions. 
Um, and then we really do it. We, we, it's, it's really a metrics-driven um, effort. So we ask every development officer has to do 15 face-to-face -face visits a month. They have to present two proposals a month, and they have to raise a million dollars in a year. So we actually, it's very akin to sales, although we, you know, in our profession we don't like to say that, but it's true um, that that the development staff have a set of people, a set of prospects they're dealing with, and they have a metrics that we measure them on. And it's 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 a pretty it's a pretty simple model. We talked a little bit about this uh, estate giving uh, last year. We we launched something called the 1893 Society, which is anybody who has us in their will um, or have have told us that we're in their will and that they're going to make a bequest to the university. We include them in this group. We bring them to campus. Uh, we educate them. We celebrate them. We we celebrate the fact that they're that they've made this um, provision for the university um, in their in their state. Uh, we also work on our foundation and corporate relations side of the house. And uh, actually, um, Anna Gramlin Dean is here in the back. She can wave to everybody. She runs our foundation effort. Uh, we're, and we're going to be hiring somebody uh, in the corporate relations um, area. And just, just, I just wanted to throw these up here because I think there are areas where the university has uh, sub-optimized and where we have opportunities. So we want somebody who's caring about what's the corporate community look like. Uh, you, you have some obvious ones like Boeing. There are a lot of other large corporations that hire our students. They have um, successful businesses because of our students. They have uh, many of them have corporate foundations where they give money. But if you're not there making your case, and if you're not engaging them again, then then you're not going to be successful. So we are going to be hiring a director of corporate relations uh, uh, after the next into the next fiscal year. We work very closely with um, the Office of Research and Economic Development. Anna does a great job there. And then we work with these folks to, um, based on their needs. So programmatic foundations tend to have very specific um, guidelines where they say we care about rules. And so then our job is to go back on campus and say, well, who do we have that's working in that space, and how do we make those marriages? And then, and then, can we? Uh, is it appropriate for us to get a proposal uh, in front of them? And then we work with the Office of Research. Um, we want to make sure that we're not stepping on their toes and that they're fully engaged with us and, and, and supportive of those activities. Um, then there's some other donor audiences that I think we're, we're just starting to uh, think about, and, and MSU has not done maybe a very, as good a job as, as we could have. And, and, and the faculty and staff, uh, the campus I just came from, we had about, our participation rate was about 24%. That was 24% of the employees made a gift of some, some amount. Uh, it's very low here. It's like 1%. Very low, and part of that part of that is because I don't think we've done a good job at the foundation to to have a very robust program, frankly. And so I think we'll see that change as we move ahead and as we launch our campaign, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then the visibility of giving and the visibility of why this is important will be will be um, more acceptable. Another reason is because some of our faculty give to other things that aren't us. The Museum of the Rockies is its own 501c3. If I could go back in time, I probably would have not gone that route, but it is what it is. And, and of course, the Bobcat Club has its own 5-1-C-3, which, which we're going to be uh, changing and, and so forth. So some of that's some of it, why it's low. But I think generally, this idea of how do you engage your campus, um, how do you make them feel a part of the campaign. And one of the nice things is when you see buildings being built and when you see new faculty being hired and you see the announcement like we had the other day that we're, we have somebody giving money to faculty, uh, that that starts to really uh, hopefully change the culture. A retired faculty gifts. There are several universities around the country that have great programs in this space. We don't do very much. There is a um, there is an association of retired faculty, and we're going to be working more closely with them. And then parents a parents program. We we have we don't have really have a parents program, but we need one. So these are some other areas that we're going to be working on. So uh, on September 25th, we're going to be announcing the campaign for Montana State University. This is the first comprehensive campaign that the university has done which is somewhat surprising because the university has been around for 121 years. Uh, but there's no time like the present. And so on the 25th, we're going to announce um, the What It Takes campaign. And basically, the campaigns work as you have, two, um, you have two phases. You have your silent phase or your leadership phase where you're not public and you're out talking to donors and you're developing your, uh, your priorities and you're talking to your major donors like Jake Jabs and Norm as Bjornsson and saying, we want you to be a part of the campaign. They come in during what we call the silent phase. Uh, and that's been happening for the last four years. 
Today, this year, in September, we're going to announce the public phase. So that phase will go all the way through 2018, and it'll be three years of us allowing us to raise our voice, uh, establish our brand, reestablish ourselves in the state in terms of positioning. And President Cruzado has a, a saying where she says, you know, said to me the other day, you know, Chris, we don't polish our boots in Montana. And I said, well, you better get ready because what a campaign is going to do is it's going to be a gigantic boot polishing machine. Everybody's going to know what we're doing. And that's part of what you want a campaign to do. And so it's very exciting, and uh, we're very excited about that uh, and what that means for the university going forward. There are going to be three basic components in the campaign, people, places, and programs. And so you can, you can read those here, but people, scholarships, faculty support, um, places are things like leadership, uh, leadership centers, buildings, facilities, and then programs are all kinds of things, um, from, from somebody who's doing some work in the snow lab to some of the work that, the good work that you all uh, do. One of the reasons you do campaigns, people always say, well, why, 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 would, you know, why do you do a campaign? One reason is it creates a real sense of urgency for you when you're talking to your donor community, right? Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you a gift, but uh, why now? This gives us a chance to say, now would be a good time, and here's why we want you to be a part of this effort. Um, the campaign also allows you to raise your profile and build your brand. I think if we're able to do a campaign uh, of the size that I, I think is, is doable, we haven't determined the size quite yet, and we're going to hopefully nail that down in the next couple of months. Then it'll be a, it'll be of a size that will not be achievable by anybody else in the state. And what that will do for us is allow us to reassert our brand. And really, positioning and branding is part and parcel of a successful capital campaign, not only in our state but in our region, in our in our nation. So we're excited about that. And then, of course, you know, last but not least, it brings money into the university to fund good programs. To, uh, to bring students here to fuel the good work that's being done. And I'll, I'll share with you as being a newcomer to uh, the Montana State family, I've been incredibly impressed with the quality of our faculty and the quality of our students. I mean, this is, and, and this is why I tell the president, we need to be talking more loudly. We need to be talking more, um, uh, and it's not bragging. It's just telling the facts, right? We've got great people. We have great programs. And there's a lot to work with there. And so these funds are going to fuel that good work. As I said, the campaign has a couple of different phases. Um, there's the planning phase, the advanced gifts phase, or I call the leadership phase. And that's where we are. And that's what we've been doing the last four years. Is we've been in this phase here, uh, getting our, our ducks in a row, building our team, making sure that we've got the priorities established. Uh, we've made some leadership asks. Uh, we've raised a significant amount of money already. Uh, and then we go, you go public. And you really start to talk more broadly about the campaign. You, you, it's more of a more of a reach to everybody. So right now, if you open up our magazine for the alumni, uh, our alumni magazine, or if you open up Mountains of Minds, you don't really read anything about the campaign. It's not public. But in the issue of Mountains of Minds that comes out in September, this will be the cover story, and there will be stories inside the magazine about the the campaign and what it's going to do for the university and why you care. And so that's the public phase. And that really will raise our visibility. And then the momentum phase, and then, of course, um, going past your goal and having a successful end does a couple of things. And I talk to my team about this a lot. We're really building a culture of philanthropy on our campus. Again, it's relatively new. But when you have success, when you, when you set a goal and you succeed, then those who are skeptical or maybe uh, uh, unsure of what a campaign is, they tend to come along. And uh, when I was at the University of Idaho, we did a, uh, a, a $260 million campaign that we had quite a few people on our campus, many of them faculty and administrators, who were skeptical about that because it's a big number. But if you, you have a plan and if you have the expertise and if you have the quality of people, which we do on our campus, it's definitely doable. So it's an exciting time for Montana State University, and uh, I'm certainly thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I, I came here because I, I, I was able to very quickly understand that the leadership at the university is exceptional, that the quality of the faculty is, is exceptional. Students we get and the programs we're running are really, really world class in many, many ways. I think it's a little bit under the radar, but uh, I think the campaign is going to help us, um, help us change that. So grateful to be with you today, and uh, I'd love to answer some questions. Yes, sir.
When you're asking people about their passion, do they have any sort of product list in front of them to help them think about different ways they can spend their money? That's if so, how do you get on that list? It's, it's a great question. So the, the campaign is going to have a campaign menu, uh, and that's for lack of a better word. It's going to be a, it's gonna be a priority list. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm, I've actually uh, gone out and met with the folks at Billings. I've met with the chancellor and the, 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 um, um, the, the fundraiser, my colleague there in Billings. Uh, I've been to Great Falls. We have an MOU established with them. I'm talking to the museum, and I'm also talking to Northern. My hope is that we can, uh, under President Cruzado's one MSU um, approach, have initiatives for all of those campuses and all of those entities, including PBS, on a master you know, priority list. Uh, because I think this is for a couple of reasons. One, it's a small state, and I think we want to be as inclusive as we can. But we also want to make sure that when somebody opens that menu, if you will, that there are things on there that are, that they can resonate to. But so so that's 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 maybe a more detailed answer. Most most uh, well, the way it happens most often is you're having coffee with somebody and you say, "What are you passionate about?" And they say, "Students." You know, I really I really want to support students. And then you go and then you you know. You, you go down that path with them. Well, what kind of students? And you know, and would you would you entertain a proposal to fund a student? And if you did, where would it be? What would it be for? And what kind of a student would you want to support? And what academic unit? So you, you tend to start at the high level with them, and they and then take them down a path. I was just with a donor actually um, on Tuesday, and I'm going to actually have him come to a panel for our team because he said, you know, when I met with the development officer, he said, I didn't know. I had no idea. She asked me what I care about. I had no idea. And I would come back, and, and she, he said over this month, several month process, they got there through this conversation. And, he, and, and you know what he ended up giving to? Research, which is relatively rare. He ended up doing a research, a research fund, which is relatively rare for individuals to do that. But as, to, as they talked, that's, that's, what, that's what floated his boat. And so uh, we tend to be... Um, uh, we, at, at the development staff, we tend to be unbiased listeners, which is what do you, you know, what do you care about? And if it's a, somebody graduated from business, but they say, tell me about your music program, we talk about the music program because, again, it's about being donor-centered. So the, uh, the vision is to have a priority list that would have all kinds of things on it that, that if they said, yeah, I'm interested in environmental science, right, then our plan would be to come back and, and say, well, we don't have really a lot on that, but... I'm sure we could find some things, right? And so that's really the role of the of the development staff is to come back to the campus and and find those things that might meet the desires of the donor. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm thinking in terms of environmental science. Yeah. People who have a, a conservation passion may be thinking more along the lines of something like the Nature Conservancy or something like that, and don't even think about the fact that contributing to university research is a is a, a valuable option for their contribution. I guess working for your organization to change minds about that would be a nice thing to do. Happy to do it. We were just talking earlier about place, right? I mean, this is an exceptional place, and I mean mm -hmm. just physically. And so there are people that move here and care about that place. I know uh, Dean Ray is doing a, uh, um, a, a, an initiative for the American West. I think that's right. And so he's, got, he's, he's defining this large umbrella that I think is exciting because under that umbrella you can put a lot of things. There are people that care about all kinds of things relative to um, Montana as a place, and so he's got an executive residence program program for somebody who does, um, you know, writings on the West, and then he's got some other things he's putting under there. So I think one of the concepts might be um, to look at what, how do we frame that in a way that's going to allow us to make that case because I think there are people that move here and live here. And, and, and even people who don't live here who wish they could live here because, because of the place. So there might be some, some, some work to do in terms of how do you frame that. And Because uh, I, I agree with you. In fact, I was talking to Renee, Dr. Uh, Dr. Perra, about this. The campaign materials as, as written today are light on research, and we, we're going we're gonna to work on that. Because I think we want to make sure that when the donor – we're a research university, right? So we need to make sure that it's, it's – that's clear, and that they understand that there are opportunities for research. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think one of the things that the campus needs the most is more uh, endowed chairs. Yes, sir. We've lost uh, some really leading professors in order to recruit them here with our difficulty in salary structure. Uh, 
uh, the Dow shares, and they may take a, a bit of salesmanship to some of these uh, prospective donors, or at least making them very aware of that, because it's probably not going to occur to them. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. About that is that it gives you a tremendous amount of leverage. The money invested in a Dow share can leverage a whole lot of. You bet. Totally agree with you. I would say I uh, found the same thing at Idaho. We are we are real, we are very light on endowed professorships and chairs right. here. Uh, it is a part of the campaign. Uh, it is one of the priorities. People and the president is the president set out kind of a goal of a chair at every college. Uh, I'm not sure that's I'm not sure that's the right way to go. I think maybe you're going to see three chairs here in the sciences maybe, and then you know it's going to be a mix. But I think we're, that is something that's going to be part and parcel of the campaign. We have uh, the plant sciences chair, as you know, is, is being, has gone very successfully. We have the camera chair that was just established about six months ago. And so that's an area that we are going to definitely be, be, be um, really focusing on. Here's what I've learned over time. It's not about the faculty. The sales isn't about the faculty chair or professorship. The sale is on the impact on the student. And that's, and that's where they don't make that leap, right? They, they, they think about, well, somebody's salary, my goodness, why would I do that? But what they don't realize is that they, and you can, you can get there by asking them, did you ever have a faculty member who changed your life? And they all say yes, of course. And then the answer is, those are the kinds of people we need at Montana State. We need to attract the very best, and we need to retain the very best. And if you can, if you can go backwards from the student experience, they get it. And I think you'll see us go from a handful to, you know, to 20 or 30 of these before the campaign's over. Student research effort or, or opportunity will be expanded by this as well. You right? betcha. Yeah, and the plant sciences chair is an interesting one because it's, and we have a gift, so there's a gift level, right? It's $2 million to establish a chair. It's a $1 million to establish a professorship. And we have a, uh, we have a whole slew of things, faculty fellowships, 500,000, those kinds of things. And uh, one of the things that I, I discovered when I got here was they had these strange stipulations on them, like, you know, you can only spend X amount for this or X amount for that. And I said, well, why do we have those constraints? That really, there really should be no constraints on them. They should go to the dean and the dean should be able to determine with the department chair and his faculty what's the best use. And, and so the president thought that the provost did it. The provost thought that we did it. We thought that somebody else did it. Well, it turns out that we don't know where it came from, but we wiped all that out. So basically, it's pretty simple. You get a professorship, a million dollars, spins off $40,000 a year, sits on top of the state line. Some of that money can be used for graduate research. Some of it can be used for travel. Some of it can be used for salary based on the needs of, of the department and the, and, and the leadership of the college. Very powerful tools. Uh, you're gonna, we're going to be pounding on that a lot. Then you can buy me a drink after that. <laughs> okay. Coffee, Coffee's good, too. Yes, ma'am. It seems like a lot of the funding priorities have come up. It's been organized in such a way that it's coming up from departments and colleges and right. then up that way. So it's kind of in the traditional sort of siloed structure of a university. But Very there's true. a lot of amazing institutes, including the Institute on Ecosystems on campus that faculty are really excited about. And we've actually recruited some of the best faculty to MSU because of these institutes. And I feel like uh, we're not on the radar screen in a very big way, uh, in a way that might ha actually help the campaign. So um, again, I'm, I'm new to the party. And if I could go back in a time machine, I probably would have done it differently. But we are where we are today. Um, my, my question to you would be, the reporting structure of those centers go up through the provost, or they go up through uh, the vice president for research? What's, what's, the, re what's the reporting they structure? They vary, um, but uh, a few of them go to the vice president for research. Okay. Um, some of them go just to the college level, but um, some of the, the big ones, the you know, WTI yep. and Center for Biofilms and Institute on Ecosystems, Thermal Biology Institute report to the Vice President for Research. Okay. So the way that this was run, again, before my arrival, was it was very much based on um, academic units, departments coming up. And I'm not sure, and maybe that was because there was a search going on, or I'm not sure why that piece isn't, isn't stronger. Mm -hmm. um, the campaign does not go public for several more months, so I would be wide open to talking to you about how do we, how do we identify those um, entities that maybe have been left out, and how do we get them uh, more fully into the into the picture? Now, having said that, um, you know most of the effort is around individuals uh, in a, in, a, in a campaign like this. You know, 80% of the money is going to be around individuals giving to the university, and and most of those pick things that they know. And so, 
the the I had this um, I had this great conversation back at Idaho with somebody uh, at the library. She was she was she was incensed that the library's goal was a million, and that the athletics goal was thirty million, right? And so and in a big 400 people in the room she asked me this question, and I said, well, first thing you have to understand is the dollar goals are not related to the quality or the importance of the program. They're, what, they're really, what they really reflect is what your donor pool is like in a lot of ways. Because if you have people that want to come to football on Saturday and they want good seats and you got to give to get good seats, guess what? They give to that. And so I, I'm hoping we can have our donor menu for the campaign can, can have lots of things on it. And I, I, was with the, uh, I met with the uh, staff leadership the other day who, by the way, had never been to the foundation, which was surprising to me. And I said, you need something, you need something on the menu. It could be $20,000. It needs to be there. And I don't know what that is. I would say the same thing should be true for, for the research side of the house, that there should, be, there should be items on there that have been vetted and, and identified and are somewhere so that if somebody selects research as an interest on the website, that there's, this, there's a listing of things. And then for each of those, a contact, because that's the other thing that is important is Somebody may say, well, tell me about the museum. They tell, if they say that to us, tell me about the Museum of the Rockies, we're going to then take them and, and hand them over to Linda, who's the development officer over at the museum, and you need somebody to make sure that, that, that they don't fall through the cracks, that they're owned by somebody, and that somebody answers their questions and somebody pursues them. But I would be, I'd be more than happy to, have, uh, to entertain that. It would have to go up. The process that we have now went up through the provost, and she had to approve each of the initiatives. Some did not get approved. Some were identified at the grassroots and then got to her desk and she said, not a priority. And that's, that's you know, the campaign can only have a certain number of priorities. We're not going to be able to raise a billion dollars. We probably could come up with a billion dollars worth of needs if we really <laughs> spend about 20 minutes thinking about it. But we're not going to be able to raise that amount of money. So how do you prioritize uh, a number and the initiatives that are going to be most valuable to the university? And there are times when there's something that's very important to an individual faculty member that's their life dream and it's not going to make it onto the list. And I think that's one of the tough things about being a dean, frankly, is the deans had to make some of those calls. And I was sat in a meeting with the dean and his faculty and there were some people that felt like their project should be on the list and you know, the answer is it's not on the list this time. Doesn't mean it's not in the quiver because again, if somebody comes and says, tell me about X, we're going to come back and we're going to say, how do we find out about X? Because we're going to want to go to the donor with that. And I can t guarantee one thing that's a truism about campaign, we'll have all these priorities, and at the end, it's not going to look anything like that. Because those are guesstimates we're making, and the donors are going to come in with a whole bunch of other ideas, and they're going to have a whole host of different areas that they're interested in, and so the campaign at the end will look much different. But you have to have something to start with, and you need to have some framework from which to t talk about it. And so people, places, and programs, pretty broad. You can fit everything under that. So it gives us some flexibility. So I'd be happy to further talk with you about that. Love to hear your ideas. Chris, I wanted to say thanks for coming and giving a talk to us. It's very helpful uh, to this institute. And we have about um, over a dozen faculty fellows, over 100 affiliates on campus, many students. And I think we have a lot to learn. And I, and I have a question. But first, I just want to say I'm one of those lifetime alumnus members and I'm alumnus of multiple institutions and I'm very interested in how they all engage me in different ways. Yeah. And so it's, it's neat to hear the presentation on that. But what my question is about the Institute on Ecosystems and we're a statewide institute. Right. But we're realized, we're practical reality, we're MSU or U of M. Right. And so I wonder how can the, what can the institute do to better position itself to be a priority mm -hmm. in subsequent fundraising efforts to the university and can the statewide aspect of the institute be perhaps a feather supporting that? Because it, we have competition, and that's yep. good, yep. but we have collaboration as well. And I wonder if that is something that can be leveraged for outcomes that are positive to Montana State University. Right. Yeah. It's a good question. You know, I, I think one of, the power, one of the powerful things about Montana State University is it's a land grant. It's a statewide, right? And so that's something that we need to be better at. I think our extension effort like every other campus I've been on that's been a land grant, uh, hasn't fully been activated. So I think there's some things we can do there. But I think there is power in saying our footprint is the state. Um, my colleague at Mon University of Montana, Shane Geese, and I, we knew each other from previous lives. Um, we need to be working more closely with them. Uh, we recently went to a meeting with the, um, the Commissioner of Higher Education, 
and um, the two are our two institutions, and we were both singing from the same songbook, and there's power in that, right? In a small state like ours, there's power in saying we both, we, you know, we all care about this, as opposed to this fragmented approach of divide and conquer. So I, I, we're going to, we, we, we now meet month, monthly on the phone, he and I, and I actually want to get our boards together. I think there's great power there. We both have very powerful boards and get them together. That's great. It can be very helpful. So, but to your point, I think raising your profile, I think it's a lot about storytelling, and I, I think that the university can do better in this regard. Um, we're certainly going to take, take our piece of this uh, pie where we're going to be doing a better job of telling stories about students who came here who, who had their lives changed. Yeah, that's what we do. And when they tell that story, and it, you do it in a way that's meaningful to people, um, whether it's video or live or whatever, it, that, that's how you get people to come along with you. And so I would say, um, you know, identifying the impact that, 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 that your efforts have, right? What are the impacts that they have and in what communities? And then that's what people want to fund. They want to fund, they want to make a difference. Nobody gives the money and, and then says, don't make a difference with this. You know, they, they all want it to do something. And when you can make the case and tell the story about what it's going to do, then, um, then you can get people to come along with you. So I would say, and I'd be happy to meet with you offline, but I would say, you know, identifying what the impact is of the, of the institution, and then in what ways and what communities. And then, you know, let's say one of the communities is, you know, Great Falls. And we have somebody in Great Falls that says, who we know has been a donor, and we know they've been a donor in this space. Maybe we, you, you know, you, you need to put you two together and have lunch with them or whatever it might be. So I'd be interested in learning more about, about what you do and how we might be able to be helpful in that regard. But generally, people give to people they give to uh, institutions that they know and, that, and they give to successful endeavors. We have all three of those. And as the campaign rolls out, you're going to have a, we're going to have a chance to bring a lot more people along with us than we have. So the, 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 it's really an exciting time. And the fact that there hasn't been a comprehensive campaign is one of the things that attracted me, frankly, because all the raw material is here. I mean, it's great product. It's just sitting here ready to go. And so I think you're going to be surprised over the next year or two what, what we're going to be able to do. And, Appreciate you taking the time to spend your lunch hour with me. I feel like I should have brought cookies or something. I don't know. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. Thank and I, and I, again, Mike, will you get my contact information out? I'd be happy. I've got a very open door policy. If people want to call me, send me an email, have a question, always open to that. And Anna, who's here, um, is also uh, does a lot of work in the foundation space, and she does it. So she's gotten money for WTI, and and several other. Uh, entities on campus. She's terrific and Matt's her, her, her bodyguard. So. Uh, oh. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Ah.